In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. I got to say, this week's services is, and especially this night, is why I'm a priest. I love it. And if time permitted, I, I would love to ring, uh, ring all the changes of the week and of this night. But uh, this, the service is long enough. So I've spent my adult life um, split between the academic life and the church life. And one of the things that I've observed is that professors complexify and preachers simplify. So I'm going to try to take the preacher's role tonight and simplify a little bit. I have uh, two short phrases and two images. I've been fascinated for, well, ever since Christmas season. I've been fascinated with the collect of the incarnation that has those two phrases. O oh God, who wonderfully created and yet more wonderfully restored. I've been so captivated by it, I've used it in many of the birthday cards I've written uh, to folks in the congregation. O oh God, who wonderfully created and yet more wonderfully restored the dignity of human nature. Grant that we may share the divine life of him who humbled himself to share our humanity, your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Tonight, we celebrate the fact that God wonderfully created us and yet more wonderfully has restored, has restored us. So first, O oh God who wonderfully created the dignity of human nature. I've been reading of late this lovely little book by Russ Ramsey, Rembrandt is in the Wind, Learning to Love Art Through the Eyes of Faith. And Ramsey has a chapter in here on uh, Michelangelo's amazing statue, David. The David was, was drawn out of a, was a, of a gigantic, slab of marble, 12 tons, 18 feet long. It was called the giant. The original artisan who brought it to Florence whittled down what he had considered excess so that it couldn't be, it could only be so wide. And he'd also bored a hole where he imagined the legs of the David should be. The city fathers who had wanted a, a David to put in the, uh, uh, to put in the city, the city fathers fired him when they decided that he had disfigured the block, making it too narrow and badly placing the hole for the legs. Ten years later, they tried another artisan and they fired him too. After 35 years, 35 years of just lying out in the elements, in 1501, the giant finally meets the master artist who will draw the David out of him, the 26-year-old Michelangelo. For three years, Michelangelo worked with material that was both majestic and flawed, chipped away until he created one of the most stunning statues ever made. Young David, slingshot at the ready, with a glare that looks to me like an angry Elvis, telling Goliath, no, seriously, Look at it sometime. That's Elvis, an angry Elvis, saying with his eyes, buddy, you're going down. Now, God, I want you to know, I want you to understand, I want you to believe. God does with each of us what Michelangelo did with the marble giant. So many people think that the gospel begins with, you're a dirty, rotten, awful sinner. Yuck! That's not where the gospel begins. The gospel begins with, you were made by God the artisan to be glorious and to be beautiful. Now, God's work in his creation of you and me it's not like his original creation, which was what from which was from what second century theologian Irenaeus called virginal earth, 
No, but it started to work on you and me. <laughs> there was no virginity to what he was working on. In creating you and me, God worked with flawed material, corrupt material, polluted material when he started to work on it. We are, we are products of his post-fall creative work. It's as though some other alien artist had come in and chipped away and put a hole where put holes where holes shouldn't be. And, and God comes along and says, not a problem. I can work with that. Just like Michelangelo had done. Not a problem. I see beauty in there and I'm going to draw it out. You and me. Flawed DNA. Flawed family history. Flawed birth order in some cases into a flawed world where your finite abilities meet a flawed upbringing, flawed schools, flawed coaches, flawed peers, flawed messages about what is true and about who you are. Despite the flaws though, you and I, by the God of the Bible, are invited to understand that we ourselves are wonderfully created in the first place. Even in our fallen state, did you know that James, the brother of Jesus, says, we are according to the likeness of God. James chapter 3, verse 9, look it up. I often write on kids' birthday cards the line from David's 139th Psalm. I give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, including me, and my soul knows it very well. I found in coaching Little League Baseball that for all the kidding about pampered kids and inflated grades and participation trophies, most kids do not get the message that they are valued, important, loved, fearfully and wonderfully made. We all need to see ourselves, I submit, in the incredibly lovely, powerful portrait of David vulnerable yet strong, fierce and brave and crafty. You realize that with his weapon, Goliath with his, with his big old sword and all that stuff, he's not even gonna be able to get close. David's gonna go, shoo, gotcha. Crafty, fierce and brave, capable of taking down giants, each a work of art as David Gunger sings, you make beautiful things. You make beautiful things out of the dust. You make beautiful things. You make beautiful things out of us. At the same time, Russ Ramsey makes one critical observation. One critical observation about the incredible piece of art that Michelangelo's David is. It has a fatal flaw. There are tiny cracks in his ankles. So, if I may, camera guys, sorry. Okay, he's posed like this. The handle of the slingshot is, is down here. The slingshot is behind his back, and he's holding the pocket up here, so it concealed. And there's a little bit, he's, he's resting on his right leg. It's pretty straight with a little, little lean back here, and his left leg is forward and he's looking over here he's like you can just see him go Shoop! he's just all poised for that the problem is there are cracks in his ankles one day whether it's because of the torque or whether you know florence there's tectonic plates there are volcanoes the earth moves sometime. For one reason or another, David's going down. And when he goes down, it's gonna be <laughs> And all that marble, it's just gonna explode. It's just gonna explode. It's each one of us too. We have cracks in our ankles. Something that's gonna bring it all down. An addiction or an obsession 
some form of gluttony or lust you can't break and that eats away at your soul, anger or bitterness. So many times in the last few weeks, I found myself walking away from a conversation going, like, man, how did my fuse get so short? I mean, I didn't just so, I feel like there's such a trail of tears I've left behind. I don't even, I don't even know where to begin to apologize. But I don't know, anger or bitterness pride or envy or sloth or some, some deadly brew that's invisible to you, but that slowly poisons you from the inside. A, a relationship that just won't go your way, that makes you just give up on people. A horrible boss that makes it impossible to work for any other boss. A disappointment with the gap between your own vision of yourself and what you see unfolding. Disappointment that makes you give up on everything and put you in a fetal position for the rest of your life. The realization you're not gonna get, I don't know, the cello scholarship you've been working towards. You've, you've been violated by somebody you thought you could trust. And you know what, eventually, I hate to break, to, I hate to break it to you, you're gonna die. Maybe a car accident, maybe a fatal disease. Maybe simply old age and your body says, I'm done. There's no free pass. There's no escape clause. Nobody doesn't have cracks in their ankles. None of us gets out of here alive. Ezekiel to the rescue. So, simple point number two from Ezekiel's vision of dry bones. Oh God, who yet more wonderfully restored the dignity of human nature. Ezekiel writes during Judah's exile. Now, David's line has shown cracks in its ankles. David's had his Bathsheba and Uriah and Absalom. The kingdom divides after Solomon, falls into idolatry, injustice, and immorality. God sends him into exile. Then Ezekiel sees Israel and Judah as dry bones scattered in a valley of desolation. He sees them doing what? Rising to new life. Tonight's passage tells us our God surveys a valley of dry bones, exploded David's with just shattered pieces of marble everywhere. God surveys the valley of dry bones, gathers the bones, reveals the skeletons, gives them new bodies, and breathes new life into them. Our God raises the dead. As the spiritual says, well, your toe bone connected to your foot bone, your foot bone connected to your heel bone, your heel bone connected to your ankle bone, your ankle bone connected to your leg bone, your leg bone connected to your knee bone, your knee bone connected to your thigh bone, your thigh bone connected to your hip bone, your hip bone connected to your back bone, your back bone connected to your shoulder bone, your shoulder bone connected to your neck bone, your neck bone connected to your head bone. I hear the word of the Lord. What makes the whole thing work, though, is that the Lord tells Ezekiel, okay, it's not just going to be some zombie lying there, some bad dream from some sci-fi. The Lord tells Ezekiel, call on the four winds. And then the Lord goes, when the winds have been gathered, the Lord goes and breathes new life into these dry bones. On the cross, on the cross, Jesus offers up his own body unto death. So his father can bring him back, foot, heel, ankle, ankle, leg, knee, thigh, hip, back, shoulder, neck, head, full of the breath of the Spirit. And then amazingly, he breathes that same life into us. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead gives new life to you and me now. 
in promise of an eternity of newly embodied life that begins now. Now, while the reconstitution of our physical bodies waits, the inward renewal with which it begins does not wait. As Paul says, the outward self wastes away while the inward self is renewed day by day. For day by day, we, even now, are being transformed into the image of Christ himself. New appetites, new capacities, new perspectives, new hope, new love, new walking away from grumpiness and angerness and bitterness. A new sense of what it is not only to be wonderfully created, but now even more wonderfully restored. That's tonight's message. The wonder of what it is to be not only wonderfully created, as wonderful as that is, but even now, to me, more wonderfully restored because Christ is risen. So Ezekiel's message is this. Give me just a couple more minutes. Ezekiel's message is this. Those who acknowledge they are dead before their death, he raises to eternal fellowship and glory. Die then, I urge you, before you die, so that you can live before life after death. And then on and on and on. And what that means is that for now, the very broken, even shattered places of our lives become the markers of his greatness and our beauty. I cannot get through this Easter season without remembering with deep fondness and affection our dear sister Martha Tiller, whom we lost this year, who in the last few years of her life offered her descent toward blindness as the catalyst for internalizing her tenebrae readings so that when the passion of John comes out of her, it's no longer a mere reading. You can't even call it an enactment. She was breathing it out over us. And right now, and I have his permission to share this with you, our dear brother John McConnell, whose place is up there in the choir, but whose body is cancer ridden. John McConnell offers up the cancer that is coursing through his body, not as the auger of the death that is indeed approaching, but as the context in which he is living, joyful in hope and radiant in faith and love. I know full well what's going in my body. I know full well what's going on in my body, he says. But I want people to know I'm in the business of living, not dying. And so Sunday after Sunday, and of course tonight, John and Janet dress up to participate with us in online worship. They dress up to participate in online worship with us. And they've left the Christmas decorations up in their house because they're celebrating the incarnation. And John's one remaining wish is to sing one more time with his beloved choir members. Now, John gave me permission to tell you this because he wants to bear witness to God's goodness and power. He knows in the present, he says, the renewal of the age to come. The friend, the spirit gives renewal now in advance because Jesus is no longer in the grave. Therefore, when John faces death, he knows, he says, that that death itself will be the gift by which God will raise him to newness of life. The work of art, John says, he knows he is made to be, took the cosmic event of Christ's resurrection so he and we could advance to the glory for which he was and we were made. What John lives for now, he says, is to obey what he believes God himself told him, which I commend to you. I, the Lord, will show my strength in you 
so that others might live. And so once more, O oh God, who wonderfully created and yet more wonderfully restored the dignity of human nature, grant that we may share the divine life of him who humbled himself to share our humanity, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.